Ladies and gentlemen, welcome, uh, welcome at the program organized by the Cape Town Holocaust and Genocide Center. My name is Jakub Nowakowski. I'm the director of the of the center, and it is my great great pleasure to welcome and to see um, all of you. Um, Today in South Africa, it's an important day, uh, election day. So I hope those of you that connect in from South Africa has uh, have already casted your vote. Um, as far as I know, the lines are long. Um, so maybe, maybe you'll still be able to do it uh, later on. Uh, but we won't be talking about uh, politics or at least uh, politics of contemporary South Africa. Uh, we will look at the uh, politics of uh, of equally uh, complicated uh, uh, time and places or relationship and dynamics between uh, between um, Polish Jews uh, and uh, Poland um, and the land of uh, Israel. Um, and the discussion is uh, connected to a very special uh, publication. Um, um, Publication which which has been uh, issuing uh, volumes for um, many many years um, by now. Um, Pauline studies in in Polish Jewry. Uh, we're looking at uh, at uh, some of the content of the volume thirty five, which, as I mentioned, has been um, devoted to um, to the relationship dynamics in between um, Poland, uh, the Polish Jews, uh, and the land of Israel. Um, and it's called Promised Lands, uh, Jews, Poland, and the Land of Israel. Uh, this volume was, was um, published as, 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 um, as the previous ones by the Littmann Library of Jewish Civilization and the uh, Liverpool, Liverpool University uh, Press. Um, and before I'll introduce uh, our, um, our honorable uh, uh, speakers, I uh, would like to recognize uh, some of our uh, partners uh, without whom organization of this program would not be uh, possible. Um, um, so let me start with 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 our longstanding partner, uh, Jacob Gitlin Library, um, uh, Embassy of Poland, and we have with us um, His uh, Excellency Professor Adam Burakowski, the ambassador of. Uh, Poland to South Africa, who will who will deliver um, a, a short introduction uh, um, to to all of us. Um, and last but not least, I'd like to recognize uh, Mrs. Connie Weber, um, uh, who who uh, was instrumental in making uh, making this uh, publication uh, possible. And if Connie is is joining us from Krakow, uh, I'm passing my my uh, greatest uh, regards to him to her and. Uh, Professor Jonathan Weber, her husband. Uh, but that's enough of those personal notes. Um, now I would like to uh, see and ask and invite uh, His Excellency Ambassador uh, of Poland to South Africa, uh, Professor uh, Adam Burakowski. And I see he is with, with us, just not sure if he can, uh, he, he can speak. So please give us a second to make sure and um, uh, Mr. Ambassador, you should now be able to connect as a speaker. We apologize for technical issues. Hello. Yes, I think you hear me, but you don't see me. Yes, if I'm exactly. Yeah. So apologize for these technical problems, but do you hear me? Is it okay? Yes, perfectly. Okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. So it's my honor to open this uh, session. Um, and uh, I would like to um, express my gratitude to the cent uh, Center of uh, Holocaust and Genocide in Cape Town, and uh, especially the director, Jakub Nowakowski, with uh, whom and with all the center we cooperate for a long time. And uh, I'm very happy to see you all distinguished professors here, and I'm uh, very um, uh, interested in uh, hearing what uh, uh, are your um, um, input to this uh, to this very interesting topic. So let me start with some very, very um, broad uh, description that it is a common knowledge that until the outbreak of the Second World War, 
Poland was home to the largest Jewish community in Europe. For centuries, the Jewish people have been among us, seeing a livelihood and the possibility to cultivate their religion and traditions. We had lived together for many centuries. In our history, culture, science, their memory is preserved as well as their achievements. Many distinguished Polish artists, scientists, doctors were Jewish. Unfortunately, during the Second World War, the Germans murdered over 90% of Poland's Jews in the death and concentration camps. In Auschwitz-Birkenau and other annihilation places, we lost Polish citizens, among them Jewish. It is our personal loss. We think of the wartime tragedy of the Jews with utmost pain. Moreover, we want to keep in our mind the memory of Jews and their un unforgettable input into the Polish culture, knowledge, and custom. While the number of Jewish population in contemporary Poland is small, according to the recent national census in, of 2021, overall there are uh, around 8.5 thousand inhabitants of Jewish origin in our country. It still has many goals and tasks to accomplish, like the preservation of the remnants of cultural heritage of Pol Polish Jews is extremely important. And it is the further development and promotion of Jewish culture, both among Jews and Poles. Many Polish institutions are stimulating and participating in these long-term processes. Jewish cultural festivals, kosher restaurants, klezmer brands, and Jewish schools have returned to the Poland of today. It was a long journey to have Jewish life back and it started after the fall of the Iron Curtain and the collapse of communism. Shortly after 1989, the Association of Children of the Holocaust, the Association of Jewish Veterans and Persons Harmed in World War II, the Polish Union of Jewish Students and the Jewish Forum, among others, were established. In 1993, the Jewish Historical Institute Association initiated the Museum of the History of Polish Jews project, which led to the opening of the very famous Poland Museum in 2014. During these 35 years after the fall of the communists, important museums have been created, among them the Museum of the History of Polish Jews that I just mentioned in Warsaw, the Galicia Jewish Museum in Kraków that uh, our friend uh, Mr. Jakub Nowakowski was the director for a long time. They're observing uh, slowly, but surely the animation of Jewish life in Poland. The annual festivals of Jewish culture are taking place, among them the well-known festival Kultury Żydowski in Kraków, which is one of the biggest festivals of Jewish culture in the world. We are witnessing the efforts by some local Poles to commemorate the Jewish past in a country which was the graveyard of three million Jews during the Second World War. Of tremendous importance to the Jewish revival in Poland is material assistance from foreign, primarily American Jewish foundations. Among the lar largest, there are um, uh, Ronald Lauder Foundation and Taub Philanthropies. As early as 1989, Lauder Foundation opened the Jewish kindergarten and in 1994, the first Jewish school in Warsaw. Youth camps organized by the foundation were also important and formative. Jewish life in Poland today is concentrated in several cities and around several institutions. First of all, there are official Jewish communities associated in the Union of Jewish Communities in Poland. It gathers eight independent communities in Kraków, Warszawa, Poznań, Szczecin, Gdańsko, Biała, Katowice, Łódź, and Wrocław. There is also a branch in Gdańsk. Besides religious, there are also a number of secular organizations that cater for the Jewish needs in Poland. Let's name here the, the most important. In Kraków and Warsaw, there are JCCs, Jewish Community Centers. They both promote friendly and welcoming space for the local Jewish members to gather, spend time together, organize all sorts of classes and events. Some of these are also open for non-Jewish audiences. Jewish students are organized in Hillel, which is an international student organization. The biggest and the oldest secular Jewish organization that exists in Poland is um, Social and Cultural Association of Jews in Poland. It was established in 1950 and it remains active to the present day. Poland's Ministry for Culture and National Heritage has been for a long time actively cooperating with the Jewish community in Poland. The Ministry of Culture and National Heritage has allocated um, a sum of uh, more than 600 million what is uh, as their target grants and subsidies uh, for last six years for institutions run or co-run by the ministry. 
uh, whose activities include caring for the memory, culture, and heritage of the Jewish people on Polish soil, as well as the commemorating of Holocaust of Jews by the German Reich on Polish territory. Uh, grant uh, recipients include the auschwitz birkenau State Museum in Oświęcim, Majdanek State Museum, Stutthof Museum in Stutowo, the Warsaw Ghetto Museum, the Museum of Poles, Saving Jews During the Second World War, the Ulma Family Museum in Markowa, Museum of the Memory of the Inhabitants of the Land of Oświęcim, Museum of the History of the Jews in Poland, the Manuel Ringelblum Jewish Historical Institute, the Tremblinka Museum, the Gross Rosen Museum in Rogoźnica. The ministry also supported Museum Memorial of a concentration camp in Płaszów in Krakow. And this is just a part of what we do to uh, have uh, good relations with our Jewish community that we cherish all that uh, we uh, had and we are still having and we hope for a um, good and still better uh, contacts uh, with um, our um, uh, Jewish friends. So uh, after this, my, uh, I may be too long opening. I'm here ready to listen what you distinguished professors uh, are prepared, prepared for, for, for tonight. Thank you very much and have a very interesting discussion. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, um, Mr. Ambassador, for this for this overview of, the, of those of those recent developments that are positive and, 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 and those positive things that have been happening in Poland. Uh, uh, over the last uh, 30 years since uh, the end of communism. Um, so now um, uh, it is my privilege and honor to um, introduce uh, three out of four editors of that volume. And it will be the editors who will then introduce our speakers for, for tonight, the authors of two articles of that very volume that I, that I have, that I brought from Poland when moving in uh, to, to South Africa. Um, uh, so, uh, Professor Antoni Polonski uh, is a chief historian of the Global Educational uh, Outreach Program at the Pauline Museum of the History of Polish Jews uh, in Warsaw, uh, Emeritus Professor of Holocaust Studies at Brandeis University. He is a, a co-chair of the additional board, ed editorial board of Pauline Studies uh, in Polish Jewry and the author of many published uh, works. Uh, the most recent uh, being the Jews in Poland and Russia, uh, three volumes covering uh, the period between 1350 all the way until 2008. Um, professor uh, Francois Guigny uh, is a professor of modern Jewish history in the Department of Hebrew and Jewish Studies at the University College London. He holds uh, a PhD in modern history from Albert Ludwig Universita, uh, Freiburg. Uh, and specialized in the early modern uh, and 19th century history of Eastern European and more specifically Polish Jews. He has held research and teaching fellowship at the Hebrew University Jerusalem, the University of Pennsylvania, uh, the University of Oxford and uh, Dortmund College and is uh, co-chair of the editorial board of the Pauline Studies in Polish Jewry. Uh, and Dr. Scott uh, Yuri is a senior lecturer in the Department of Jewish History at uh, Tel Aviv University and the director of the Eva and Mark uh, Besson Institute for the Study of Holocaust uh, Consciousness and senior editor of History and Memory. He is currently the Waynestock uh, Visiting Lecturer of History at Harvard University. His publications include uh, Barricades and Banners, The Revolution of 1905, and the transformation of Warsaw Jewry that was published in uh, 2012, and also um, several co-edited volumes, including Key Concept and the Study of uh, Antisemitism that was published in 2021. Um, we are not having with us the fourth editor, Professor Israel, uh, Israel uh, Bartel. Um, and before I will pass uh, the floor and, and the mic um, to, to, uh, to the editors, I'd just um, like to make um, make sure uh, to, 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 um, to let you know that this um, program is recorded. Uh, you will be able to see it um, uh, soon enough on uh, Cape Town Holocaust and Genocide uh, Center's um, uh, YouTube channel. And also, if you will have questions, please post them in the uh, in the chat, and uh, we will do our best to take at least some of those uh, questions. So thank you. That's all from me. And um, Anthony, if that's uh, right, 
Yes, thank you. Well, thank you very much, Jakub. I'm very, very glad to be participating in this important event. I've known Jakub for many years when he was director of the uh, Galicia Jewish Museum. I've also, I'm sure, I'm unlike most people on this panel, been at the Cape Town Holocaust Center and at the former Garden Synagogue, which is a wonderful museum. And it's a great uh, pleasure to me that we are actually initiating this cooperation. My task is really to introduce Pauline, uh, Francois Guinea and Scott Uri will say what we try to do in volume 35. Pauline uh, studies in Polish Jewry was established in 1986 as a yearbook and it seeks to provide a resource for the growing number of scholars who seek authoritative historical and cultural material on Polish Jewry. It encourages research on an interdisciplinary basis and has sought contributions from many disciplines, history, sociology, politics, anthropology, linguistics, literature, and folklore. And from a variety of viewpoints, we wish to have a pluralistic approach. Editorial policy is controlled by a seven-person collegium made up of Eliana Adler of the Pennsylvania State University, uh, uh, Monica Garbowska of the, the Marie Curie Sklodowska University in Lublin, uh, Francois Guinet, uh, who's co-chair, professor of Jewish history at University College London, myself, uh, Michael Steinlauf, now professor emeritus at uh, Gratz College in Philadelphia, and uh, Israel Bartol, emeritus professor at the Hebrew University, and Jonathan Weber, at the uh, professor at the Institute of European Studies uh, of the Agalonian University in Krakow. In the first issue, we wrote that today, as Jewish life is slowly reviving on Polish soil, it is vital for Jews to preserve the memory of a world from which so many of us are descended and from which we derive so many of the vital springs of our being. Among Poles too, as the ambassador pointed out, there is a new willingness to investigate the past of a people who for 10 centuries lived in close proximity to them and whose history constituted an integral part of the development of the Polish lands. Our aim is to preserve and enlarge our collective memory and to investigate all aspects of our common past. We believe there should be no taboo subjects and no topics too sensitive to be discussed. Our columns are open to all of goodwill and we ask only that they write honestly and with respect for historical facts. So far, 36 volumes have appeared. And of course, the volume that we'll be discussing this evening is volume 35. It's no time here to d describe all those 36 volumes. I'll just say that volume 36, which is the most recent to be published, deals with uh, uh, childhood in Jewish uh, Eastern Europe and plans for future volumes are uh, well in hand. Volume 37 will deal with uh, uh, the encounters of Jews in Poland with Jews in Germany, the German Jews and their respective cultural traditions. Volume 38 concentrates on gender and the body. And volume 39 will be devoted to the question of how the concept of the other, whether Polish or Jewish, has been represented in works of art in the cultural sphere. I should stress that we wished in our coverage to include all those territories which were part of the former Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth. And so we encourage contributions and indeed themes on uh, Lithuania, which of course is very important in the context of South Africa, Ukraine, Belarus, and of course the western parts of the former Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, which is the theme of volume 37. I think that we have achieved a lot in the uh, nearly 30 years since volume since Pauline was established in 1986 we will have a 30-year anniversary in 2026 and I'm very glad to bring this periodical to the attention of the South African Jewish public. Thank you very much and I'll now hand over to Francois Guinet who as I said is co-chair with me of the uh, of the editorial collegium to introduce the volume. Uh, we 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 hand over to Scott in the first. Scott first, good. Who do I hand it over to? <laughs> <laughs> to me. <laughs> Thank you. I'm very Thank glad you. to hand over to Scott. It was it's one of the most enjoyable aspects of being part of the 
editorial collegium of this of this journal is that we have to plan future volumes. And when we plan future volumes, we also have to find people who can assist us, indeed take the primary role in editing the volume. It's a bit like the way in which Tom Sawyer arranged for the fence uh, to be painted by showing how attractive it was to paint the fence. And Scott and uh, Israel Bartal played the principal role in putting together this volume for which we are very grateful. Scott, it's your, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Anthony and Francois and everyone else. It's, it's always a pleasure to uh, to collaborate with uh, Pauline, which is such an amazing and important forum. I, I'll speak a little bit about how I envision volume 35. Are we 35 or 36 or 30, 35? 35, 35. But it, it may very well be that my co-editors and some of the authors envisioned it differently, which is the beauty of it all. I think we had altogether maybe 22 or 23 different contributions. Uh, we can't go into all of them in the hour we have today, but you'll hear a little bit about them. I think this volume of, of Pauline, which if I remember correctly, Anthony and Francois and Sal Bartal approached me to be part of a few years ago, is rather unique because it really does look at Polish Jewish relations in, in what we call an academia in a transnational global perspective. And often when we're looking at Poles and Jews, we're thinking of interactions in cities like Warsaw, which I've written about, or Lodz, which Francois has written about extensively, or the big picture, which Anthony has, has written about. But really what we haven't looked at and what this volume taught me more is I got deeper and deeper in this volume. I learned more and more about this topic I thought I knew. What we really haven't spoken a lot about in our field is how the great migrations of both Poles and Jews out of lands, which were historic Poland in the 19th and 20th century, as part of economic destitution or fleeing persecution to North America, to South America, to South Africa, how that also changed these two neighborly communities of Poles and Jews and change the relations between them. And in fact, the ambassador, uh, uh, well, I haven't met um, Borakowski, mentioned earlier, relations between Poles and Jews today are taking place in Poland, certainly, but they're also taking place on an international plane between organizations and communal, and communal leaders in the States, in the UK, in Israel, and South Africa. And so really, this attempt to look at the triangular relationship which really comes together quite well in the title. I'm sure it's Anthony's idea. He's very modest about his activities, but all the good, all these amazing things in, in Poland are really coming from Anthony's brilliance. This triangular relationship about promised lands, about utopias, what it means to be Jewish in the modern era, what it means to be a Jew living in Poland, what it means to be a Jew from Poland who was the heir to Israel, Israel. It's all very, it's expanding our knowledge and expanding our geography of, of what it means, what Polish Jewish history means, what Polish Jewish relations have meant and mean today. Um, so that's a larger questions, a larger meta questions we thought we'd raise, or I think a lot of these pieces together raise. Some of the more specific questions we wanted to get at, which were a bit easier to get a hold of in the earlier parts of planning this volume were, were how did so many Jews actually look at and think about Poland over the generations? Poland and Polish culture, how do they integrate into the political systems, into the literary, into the literary world? We'll hear about that from Yagoda in, in a few minutes, into the artistic realm. We'll hear about that from Kata Lerner, my colleague at Tel Aviv. Um, how did they part not the how did they envision Poland, but what role did they play in different schools and institutions in Polish politics and Polish culture? And then how did this interaction as time went on, certainly in the interwar period in the 20s and the 30s influenced the way they viewed the world, the way they viewed themselves. And then what happened when tens of thousands of them picked up and left, some of them out of the ideological yearning, some of them fleeing war, some of them on a financial destitution for the land of Israel, the lands which will become Israel. How did those tens of thousands of Polish Jews influence Israeli political culture Israeli culture, Israeli literature, Israeli journalism, um, Israeli academia, which I am part of at Tel Aviv University, um, and even Israeli nationalism to this day, as Dan Heller and I have also argued. Um, and so in the end, this is really the brilliance of Pauline and the kind of form that Anthony and Francois bring together every year. In the end, Instead of talking about Poles and Jews as adversaries, we see a deeper level of cultural interaction, 
where even though people aren't always getting along and no one on the screen is naive that everyone is always going to get along um, in different parts of the world. But even though there's sometimes adversaries and even though sometimes there are moments of tension, and even though there's sometimes moments of violence and worse, Jews living in Poland imbibed and absorbed cultural attitudes, political beliefs, and they brought with them these ideas to Israel. So in this subversive way, the volume speaks about long-standing, deeply seated interactions between Poles and Jews in the 19th and 20th century. Um, how am I with time, Dr. Ganey? Do I have five minutes to talk about the volume? Or, or Yeah, we're good. Okay. And this comes true or through, I don't know about truth, but it comes through in many of the different contributions, which again, the spirit of Pauline, for those who don't know the volume, is to bring together scholars from Poland, scholars from the States, scholars from Israel, and that's what we tried to do in this volume as well. Um, we have contributors from Israel, like Uriel Gelman, talking in a, a wonderful, and I think it's just a fantastic article, about the early Hasidic communities who came to the Eretz Israel in the 19th century. We have my, my colleague from Tel Aviv University, Rana Yona, talking about how young David Ben-Gurion left the Jewish community of the Yishuv in Eretz Israel and started fighting inter and started fighting in Polish politics in 1932, 1933. And we have an, an, an equally fantastic article by my colleague from uh, Tel Aviv, so, no, sorry, from Ben Gurion, uh, sociology department, Ifad Gutman, about how the memory of Poland is a hot political hot potato between Israel and Poland mm -hmm. today. And of course, Hannah Lerner from Tel Aviv University's School of Politics, I believe, will speak about the artistic realm in a few minutes. We also have many contributions from Poland, uh, Monica Adamczyk spoke about the great literary, Yiddish literary endeavors, Bojana Shainok wrote about Polish-Israeli relations during the Cold War, and Yagoda, our colleague from Wrocław University, will speak in a phenomenal way about how Israeli authors view Poland after the Holocaust. I believe so. Should I speak about? And not to be left behind, we had plenty of uh, authors also from the United States. Irit Deco and Natalia Lekshin wrote about the Holocaust and its shadow and how that affected Polish-Jewish relations. So you see, not only is Poland as a forum one of the most international and global forms I know of looking at academic issues, but you see even the authors themselves are coming from different locations, different continents, and Polin becomes this forum where they can really not only talk about transnational Polish-Jewish relations, but actually live it and, and enact it through their work. Francois, please. Thank you very much, Scott. That was very beautiful, and I'm not sure if I can add to that. Um, uh, but I can't resist. Obviously, it's it's wonderful to be here. Thank you, Jakub, for organizing this this event and to uh, enable us to share some of our uh, motivations and ideas about uh, this particular volume of Pauline with you. Um, perhaps building on what what Scott just said, I think the this volume uh, is a, a great example of how. Um, how visions and projections about a specific place and a specific community uh, is is entangled with with political projects and cultural projects, uh, but is also entangled with uh, individual with the fate of individual people. So people who have visions and dreams, uh, people who have a past, a present, and a future. Um, if the volume achieves something, uh, or, or it achieves a couple of things, uh, one of the things it achieves, I believe, is to uh, bring together or to, to think about the temporality of po Polish-Jewish relations in, in connection to the land of Israel. Uh, uh, and, and as Scott explained, there are so many resonances between uh, the Jewish and the political political experience. Um, which is which is deeply rooted in in the uh, in the experiences of the early modern and the modern period. So the the idea of of uh, of a place as being a place for a community, which runs so deep um, uh, throughout the struggles for Polish independence in the 18th from the late 18th century to the 20th century, has obviously had a deep deep impact on how Jews of a variety of political belief systems would envision the, the present and the future of the Jewish community. And this comes out in this volume in a, in a fantastic way, uh, especially in connection to the, 
to this very specific place, which is the land of Israel. Uh, and you see the tensions uh, which exist between uh, between uh, where people come from and where people come to. So several of the chapters in this volume speak about Nalevki, uh, about this famous central <clears throat> street of, of the Jewish quarter in Warsaw. And, and everyone was saying that, well, the new Yeshuv, the new Jewish community in the land of Israel should not be like Nalevki, should not be a trading street, should be a street of a different community. Uh, as many of the contributions uh, demonstrate, it is much more difficult to get away from the Nalevki uh, and, and certain practices of community than you would imagine. Uh, and, and that has to do, obviously, with the baggage uh, uh, with with the baggage, uh, the people who came to the land of Israel uh, arrived with, and um, so so the dimension of temporality is really very important, uh, as is what François Artaud has called imaginary topographies. So to envision the the the, the new Yeshuv as everything, but not the Nalevki, you imagine the future uh, of a place and and. Uh, uh, which obviously deeply in, in, informs the way you build this new place and also informs the way you engage with the realities of the place. And uh, we are all uh, on the call, we are all too aware of the challenges to these uh, visions and projections, um, uh, which obviously impact on this very day as well, which is seeing so much tragedy uh, and and we all struggle to find answers to the to the big questions we are facing. Uh, one way to find our way in these in these challenges is to very carefully think about the past and to to propose a and to work along a um, to work with with methods we develop and and hone in academia to try to develop a good hypothesis, to develop arguments, to work with uh, with ample evidence to make a point. And uh, the two colleagues who have contributed to this volume, whom we thought would, would uh, embody different perspectives of this endeavor are Hannah Lerner and Jago Dabujik. And I would like to introduce uh, both uh, in, um, at the beginning of, of their presentations, uh, and then hand over first to Hannah Lerner and then to Jagoda Bujik. Uh, to introduce Hannah Lerner, she is the head of the School of uh, Political Science, Government and International Affairs at Tel Aviv University. She's an expert in, in, uh, in constitution making, uh, uh, religion and democracy, global governance, and international labor rights. She has a large number of of uh, of academic publications to uh, to this uh, area of to these areas of expertise, but besides that, she has also really immersed herself into the the life and works of a uh, a Polish Jewish uh, illustrator and painter uh, um, by by the name of Henry Kechtkopf and. Um, uh, has produced a really impressive chapter about this uh, this highly creative person who bridges the pre-war uh, life of Polish Jewry, uh, a way he was a very involved uh, uh, young uh, creative creative force. Uh, the the uh, the shock and the tragedy of the Holocaust and new beginnings in the land of Israel, which went along an entire comp complete change of aesthetic and, and endeavors and and uh, but also meeting a lot of success. Uh, so a really fascinating life story and a fantastic and uh, illustration of what I uh, 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 try to capture with the term of temporality. Um, it is it is a broken biography. Uh, as so many biographies, but it is also an, a biography uh, from which we can learn a lot. Um, our second speaker is Jagoda Bujik. Jagoda Bujik is lecturer in, in Jewish studies at the Department of Jewish Studies at the University, University of Wrocław. Probably 
and I say that with a lot of care, probably the leading place for Jewish studies at this point in time in, in uh, Poland. Uh, she wrote a PhD on the literature, on the authors of the third generation of post-Holocaust uh, literature. She's an expert in Holocaust representation um, and has edited already a number of volumes and a considerable number of, of articles in this area. She's also uh, an expert in contemporary Israeli literature and culture and has worked as a translator. So she is a she is an intermediary between Poland and Israel in the best uh, understanding of, of the term. Um, at Pauline, we very much look forward at a contribution she will uh, she she uh, she uh, will provide together with Karolina uh, Szymaniak on uh, for the volume on Poles and Jews in the Prison of Culture. We are very privileged to uh, to we will be very privileged to have a contribution to that volume. In volume thirty five, Jagoda uh, had a chapter on. Um, on the th well, as as her academic expertise uh, promises, on the experience of third generation uh, Israelis coming to Poland and the reflection of these these sometimes very unexpected experiences in um, post communist Poland and how this is reflected in, in literary works uh, and also works such as the very famous uh, graphic novel by Rutu Motan Modan, sorry. Uh, which she discussed in this chapter, uh, the property, which many of you may well know. So these are our two star presenters from volume 35 of Quilin, and I invite Hannah to take the floor. Thank you very much for being here tonight. Thank you very much for this super kind introduction, and thank you for the invitation to present uh, tonight. Uh, the chapter on uh, Henry Kertkop, and again, I would like to thank the editors of volume uh, 35 for encouraging me and helping me write this chapter, which is a little bit outside of my uh, kind of usual uh, academic realm, but it was a great pleasure working together uh, on this uh, on this chapter, on this contribution. So let me share, I have a, a, a slide presentation, I will share uh, my PowerPoint. Um, I hope it works. Yeah, works well. Okay, I hope so. Very good. Excellent. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so I'm I'm delighted and honored uh, to uh, present uh, today my chapter on Henry Kerkop, who lived exactly half of his life in Poland and half in Israel, almost half a century in each country, 47 years to be exact. Um, people are usually familiar with the particular aspects of his work, either his drawings from uh, Warsaw from the 1940s or his children's books illustrations in Israel from the 60s, 70s and 80s. Uh, some of them, by the way, are still published and read widely today. Uh, by both secular and orthodox humanities. Uh, fewer people know about his films, uh, that uh, the films that he made in Poland in the early 50s, and some people know about his abstract uh, paintings uh, that he presented in various exhibitions. Um, I think less know about his activism in the post-war years. Uh, so the main goal of the of the article is to sort of connect uh, all the dots and uh, put Tertkov's personal life story within the broader context of the fascinating interconnections between Polish and Israeli cultures, and also to highlight the important influence of Polish and Polish Jewish uh, art and culture on uh, Israel, uh, which is uh, sometimes uh, uh, hidden and forgotten, and it's time to sort of bring it to light. Uh, so who is Henrik Hertkop? Uh, Hertkop was born at uh, Zielna Street, number three in Warsaw, on the 5th of April, 1910. And I know this because my grandmother was born at the same house, they were cousins. 
Um, his father, Isaac, was a merchant. He died uh, when Henrik was only a year old. His mother, Ita, was a midwife, and he had an older sister, Sarah. He learned Hebrew as a child, first at Chaim Kaplan's kindergarten, and then at the Chinuch Gymnasium. Uh, he was very bright. He graduated from the University of Warsaw Law Faculty in 1933. From the very early age, he began painting. His tutors were among the leading Polish Jewish artists of the 20s and 30s in Warsaw. First, Henrik, uh, Henrik uh, Berlevi and Vladislav uh, Weintraub and others. Before the Second World War, he participated in several exhibitions in Warsaw. None of these uh, paintings, unfortunately, survived the war. He was also involved in making animation films. And then the uh, Second World War broke out. Hertkop was drafted to the military and was sent to the Russian front. He spent the war years in Russia, partly as a prisoner of labor camps. Uh, the story of his survival is uh, really fascinating, but I leave it uh, for sort of another, another time. He returned to Warsaw, his city, in 1946 and discovered that his family was sent to Treblinka, including his mother and sister. Uh, and that his beloved city was in complete ruins. Um, because of his legal education, Hertkop was offered a senior position in the reconstructed Polish judicial system right after the war. However, he preferred to pursue his career in art. And in the next decade, he stayed in Poland and devoted his life to documenting uh, the destruction of Jewish life in Poland and to the heroic attempt to revive Jewish art and culture after the war. At this period, uh, he, uh, after the war, he met his wife in Lodz. She was a Catholic Polish young woman, around 15 years younger than him. Uh, she also was, uh, in a way, Holocaust survivor or uh, a survivor of the war at the age of 14. A German soldier kidnapped her from the street of Warsaw. She spent the war years in an ammunition, ammunition factory with a group of Jewish women who um, concealed their identity. It was a tragic story. They met, as I said, in Lodge, fell in love, got married. Uh, she couldn't have children. They Later on, they moved together uh, uh, to Israel, and she passed away relatively young. One of Hertkop's uh, known projects, uh, this is her. Uh, one of Hertkop's um, known um, projects was the, a meticulous documentation of the ruined streets of Warsaw, uh, of, of, especially of the Warsaw ghetto, in several dozens of pencil and pen drawings. During the spring of 1946, he often risked his life. Uh, making these drawings. In an interview uh, that he gave years later when he was already in Israel, he said that he felt compelled to make the drawings because he knew that even the, the, the meager um, remains of the largest Jewish community in Europe would soon disappear. On the back of each of these drawings, he identified in great details the exact location of the ruins, the buildings, or um, uh, street corners, uh, which had been turned into these unrecognizable piles of rubber, of rubble. These works were first published, uh, oh, presented actually in 1948 in exhibitions in Poland. When he moved to Israel, Hertko brought them with him and they were presented in Yad Vashem in 1958 uh, in 1960, Yad Vashem published 24 of these drawings in a special album. Few of them are part of the Washington Holocaust Museum collection, and the rest are donated, were donated to the newly founded uh, Warsaw Ghetto Museum in Warsaw. Um, in addition to the ruins, Hertkot also documented survivors and created around 80 portraits of children and uh, 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 portraits of, of people that he came across uh, with on the streets of Warsaw and in Lodz. Many of these drawings were made on random pieces of paper or cardboard that he found in the street. 
He named these uh, serious Nitzolim, survivors, and uh, added a uh, few words uh, to describe the person or the location of uh, where he encountered uh, the person on the back of the painting. Uh, again, most of uh, these are going to be presented at the newly created Warsaw Ghetto Museum. Um, during the next 10 years, Hertkop also played a leading role in the extraordinary attempt to revive Jewish culture in Lodz, Warsaw, and across Poland. Hertkop was a board member of the Association for Jewish Culture in Poland and chaired the artistic section of the association between 1947 and 1951. He was also one of the uh, founders and a uh, board member of Stuka, a cooperative of Jewish artists in Lodz, established in 1946. The goal of Stuka was to assist Jewish artists to continue creating and to preserve the, and revive the tradition of pre-war Jewish art life. 1948 was a particularly in interesting year in my view. Uh, the State of Israel was founded that year, but as I researched Hertkop's archive, it was surprising to discover the variety and quantity of projects that he was involved in during the exact same year. Um, uh, so under, uh, and under Stalinist regime in Poland. As Israelis, we focus very much on the creation of the Jewish state and often neglect to recognize the heroic endeavor of reviving Jewish life and culture that were destroyed during the war in Europe. Hertkop was one of the organizers of the first exhibition of Jewish artists in Poland after the war in Lodz. This is a picture, you can see a picture uh, from the opening night. He chaired the opening ceremony on uh, January um, 11, 1948. 23 artists presented 157 works, uh, including paintings, sculptures, and graphic design. In 1948, he also designed a poster um, that uh, for the commemoration of the fifth anniversary of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. Uh, it also appeared on the third. of Jewish artist uh, uh, conferences uh, that were organized in the late 40s and early 50s. His speeches were cited in Jewish and Yiddish newspapers. Um, so there were other exhibitions. I'm not going to go in through all the details. Um, he designed uh, the logo of the Yiddish book, the Yiddish publishing house that uh, was established in Lodz in 1947 by David Svald, and designed the covers of most of the books published by, um, by the Yiddish book during uh, the first few years, and illustrated um, what I think was uh, probably the first post-war Yiddish school textbook uh, that you can see here, published um, again in 1948. At the same time, he also began illustrating children's books in Hebrew, something that will become his main profession after moving to Israel. In 1947, for example, he illustrated these uh, booklets, Chaveri Alfon Aleyadei Israel, a textbook for the study of Hebrew published by the Chalut Center in Poland and was used in schools uh, and other, uh, uh, other booklets for, uh, for children. Here are some examples. Um, Hertkop worked closely with some of uh, the leading uh, Polish filmmakers and was involved in several milestones of Polish cinema. This is another area of his sort of 
um, art that I think deserves um, more additional research. I'll only mention very, very few examples. So in 1946, he was um, assistant director in one of the first films produced in Poland after the war, Forbidden Songs. Um, it was a, a, a huge success. Nearly 11 million people watched the film in Poland during the first three years after its release, and he's still considered one of the most popular Polish films. Here you can see him in these photos. Um, another important film, um, which Hertko, uh, uh, to which Hertko computed, compu contributed artistically was, um, um, I'll translate to English, it was uh, called Border Street in 1949, the first film on the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. Uh, directed by Alexander Ford, one of the chief figures in Polish cinema, head of film Pol Polski, the, the uh, production company, and a founding member of the Lodge Film School. So Hertkop created the scenery paintings for the film, which received various awards, including the gold medal at the Venice Film Festival. He directed, uh, he, uh, wrote the screenplay and directed some other uh, films during the early 50s. And with all this success in 1957, at the age of 47, he decided to leave all of this, all of this success behind and move to Israel together with his wife and 60,000 other Jews, uh, which were part of what is known as the Gamulka immigration. Uh, and in Israel, he had to start all over again for the third time. He had some advantages compared with other immigrants, I guess. Uh, he had some friends who knew him from Poland and he could speak Hebrew. He could speak and read Hebrew. And for the rest of his life, another 47 years, he continued to make his living only based on his art. Uh, he held exhibitions. Uh, but mostly became fam famous for his picture books illustrations. And this is the first children's book uh, that Echkop illustrated, uh, a book in Israel um, written by Rafael Saporta, Ayoy Tali Geffen, um, I Once Had a Grape Vine, uh, published by Masada in 1962. Echkop very quickly became a leading illustrator working with the most important publishers in the 60s until the 90s in Israel. Um, he viewed picture books as a central educational tool of Israel's future generations. His illustrations indeed are distinctive in their naive style, did didactic uh, approach and historical uh, precision. And here I'll show you We'll go very quickly through them. Uh, some of them, this book, for example, was first published in 1966 and is still being published today and read by every kindergarten children uh, in Israel. Uh, he overall uh, illustrated around 370 books. Uh, again, many of them uh, targeted young, secular, Hebrew-speaking Israeli audience. Uh, They also include uh, textbooks for schools, uh, including, I'm, I don't know how am I with time, uh, I'm kind of rushing through. You have something like five minutes. Okay, Anna. good. So uh, this is, for example, um, textbooks that he illustrated for uh, school uh, children's, um, one of the most notable uh, books that he illustrated, uh, Mikaot Israel, uh, a series of, of textbooks for first to fifth graders, um, published in several editions in the 60s and 70s. Again, every, I remember as a child studying with these books uh, in school. Uh, his, the historian Yael Dahl, who's really a world leading expert on children's uh, uh, literature in Israel called these books Medurat uh, uh, uh Every kid grew up with, with these books and with these images. What even she didn't know, oh, and these are, uh, sorry, uh, his biblical illustrations. He was fascinated by, by biblical stories and uh, published several books 
uh, where uh, uh, books that included these illustrations of, of uh, known biblical stories. <clears throat> what is less known to the sort of secular audience Uh, is Hertgob's, uh really great influence also on the Orthodox community in Israel, uh, where he's often recognized as the most beloved illustrator. He illustrated many books for the religious community uh, in Israel, uh, and this is a particular kind of successful uh, series of books that were very popular among Orthodox and ultra-Orthodox and are still being sold today. Sipuretza uh, Dikim. The series contains 120 booklets based on uh, Midrash, Agadah, and traditional stories of Jewish communities from around the globe. So beginning in the early uh, 1980s, the series was published by uh, Machanaim Press. And as I mentioned, it's still being sold today. Uh, 40 years after uh, it was first published. Many of these books have been translated into um, other languages, Yiddish, Russian, English, French, and Spanish. But the bright colors and cheerful faces that are so distinctive of Hertgob's illustrations uh, cover the dark shadow in his heart, memories of lost life and culture, which he carried with him for the rest of his life. And I'd like to share with you some of uh, his kind of personal paintings um, as, as time permits. Some of these paintings uh, were presented in exhibitions, but not all of them. And if you remember the birds and the happy faces uh, and the plants and the houses and uh, how he presented them to uh, children, these are the kind of images um, and feelings and thoughts that he expressed in, in his kind of more personal drawings. The houses are falling apart, the ground is shaky, the colors are dark. <coughs> He also had very, I mean, often sometimes kind of philosophical titles uh, to, the, to the drawings. So maybe I'll stop here um, and I'll, just say uh, for this kind of as a last comment that for almost two decades after his death, Hertkob's art continues to live in both Poland and in Israel. The books that he illustrated are still distributed um, and his art uh, is being presented in Israel in exhibitions still uh, after uh, his death, both in uh, and also in Poland in the new Warsaw Ghetto Museum and in other places around the world. I've only shown you know, a small part of his art, and I'll just say uh, that um, throughout his life in Israel, Hertkop made a special effort to preserve the memory of the Polish Jewish and Yiddish culture that it, uh, was destroyed in the war. And I think that, um, that now when um, you know, Israel is kind of uh, uh, reaching its 70, uh, sixth year, we are beginning to recognize the incredibly important influence, um, which was by and large hidden all these years. And I hope that uh, these chapters of, will help shed light on, on this sort of crucial part um, of shared Polish and Israeli history. Thank you very much. Thank you. It was beautiful. Thank you very much, Anna. Uh, very much appreciated. We will have uh, questions and answers and comments from the floor from the audience uh, after the presentations. 
So uh, I now would like to invite uh, Jagoda Bujik to take the floor. As I mentioned before, the topic, Other Family Stories, the third post-Holocaust generation's journey to Poland was the title of her chapter. And I assume and hope that she will speak about that as well now. Thank you very much for being with us. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you also for this uh, wonderful uh, introduction uh, earlier. And I'm very happy to be here with you tonight. Thank you very much for the uh, invitation. And uh, there are a couple of reasons why I'm particularly excited uh, about presenting my uh, my chapter uh, here tonight for, for the Cape Town community. And I think the mo probably the most important of them is that one of the most important possibly arguments I'm making in the in the chapter is that dealing with history is a way of understanding the presence. And I think this um, this observation uh, remains a very relevant one. And uh, it's very important to keep it in mind in uh, in various uh, contexts, but also because the uh, texts I'm analyzing in the chapter reveal this less obvious role of Poland uh, as a source of understanding the presence, the Israeli presence in in that context. So, uh, so let me start. The motif of families reliving the experience of their Holocaust memories became most prominent in Israeli second generation literature, by which I mean literary texts written by the children of Holocaust survivors and their peers. Silent families and traveling to Poland in the 1970s and the 1980s, a country which has nothing more to offer to its visitors than a sense of emptiness, is one of the themes that transpire as the most visible in this group of texts. It is also third generation writers who reach for the variously interpreted motif of returning to one's roots. However, in the text I have selected for discussion, that quest has a changed meaning as the context of defining the author's generational belonging and the circumstances in which they employ the theme of going back to Poland are changed too. By introducing ambiguity to the solidified national schemata or by altering them altogether, the authors discussed in my paper turn a family experience into a form of a statement. Each of the texts under consideration here distances itself from what is considered to be a memory mainstream with the use of different means of expression. In many of the second generation works, the dichotomy between the categories of the Holocaust and rebirth is projected onto national and ge uh, geographical planes, thereby juxtaposing the Jews and the Gentiles, as well as Poland, the land of the Holocaust, and Israel, the land of, the, of Jewish rebirth. The latter sequence and its literally spatial dimension perhaps most adequately represents one of the many functions performed by the Holocaust in creating today the official narrative of Israeli identity transformed, reproduced, and deconstructed by culture. Authors classified as the third generation, however, more and more often distance themselves from that scheme. The image of Poland they construct is often significantly different than the second generation's perception, as well as in the official narratives. Unlike the latter, for many of the third generation authors, Poland ceases to be only the place with a mark left on it by the Holocaust, a testimony of a void, the country of death placed in opposition to the land of life, Israel. This is likely to be the case in a situation when a family journey to Poland burned, burdened by with individual conditioning becomes a, an alternative to the collective experience of a school pilgrimage. The experience of Poland in the family individual literary journey of third generation writers seems to be slipping out of the official discourse of the Holocaust memory and thus deconstructing the categories that the discourse applies. Such a vision is conjured up by Rutu Modan in her well-known graphic novel Haneches that was published in English uh, under the title The Property which recounts a journey of a young Israel, Israeli, Mika, and her grandmother, Regina, to Warsaw, a place in which Regina spent her childhood and youth. 
the apparent goal of the visit is to reclaim an apartment which used to belong to the family and which was confiscated during the war. From the first scenes, it seems clear that Regina's war experience has left her with a feeling of great resentment of Poland and the Poles. Because of that, she incessantly tries to distance herself from the visit. When still, still on plane, she says, quote, Warsaw if, is of no interest to me. It's one big cemetery. Yet, it turns out that the real goal of Regina's journey is not her struggle to reclaim the lost property, which happens to be non-existent, but to find her pre-war lover, a Pole. The resentment of Poland Regina has so far manifested, is only a facade. Modan, hence, uses the motif of Poland seen as a big cemetery and apparently recalls one situation after another in order to construct this motif, a family trip to a world in which there's nothing to search for, and a school trip with a prefixed schedule, Monday, Treblinka, Tuesday, Majdanek, along with gas chambers. These are quotations from, from the novel. Each of the tropes, however, is gradually deconstructed, while the protagonist steadily reads her story of them. And now one of uh, one example of such of such mechanism. On the plane from Tel Aviv to Warsaw, the protagonists meet a group of Israeli high school students who are on their pilgrimage to memorial sites. Just a moment later, Modan cuts her younger protagonist off that experience. During a conversation with the group's guide, Mika admits that when she was a high school student herself, she did not visit Poland. From the very beginning, this fact separates Mika's experience from the experiences lived by most of her peers, as well as clearly indicates that Haneches is a different story. Which each, with each episode that follows, this claim gains more substance, setting Mika's and her grandmother's journey apart from those rooted in the common consciousness of, cliche, uh, of cliches about Israeli travels to Poland. In the scene where Mika meets for the first time with Tomasz, a Polish guide to Jewish Warsaw, the man immediately guesses Mika's origins, reasoning. Here I quote, let's see, you're sitting in a cafe in the ghetto, you look sad, End of the quote. His attempt to ironically approach the cliched emotionality of Israeli Jewish visits to Poland proves a failure. Mika's sadness is not caused by the Holocaust, but by the recent death of her father. In that way, the concepts of death and mourning change their context, cemented by Israeli confrontations with Poland of the collective, nationally determined, and politically charged trauma. The ultimate, the ultimate fracturing of the cliché of Poland as the Jewish cemetery takes place in the climactic scene on the Catholic All Souls Day in a Christian cemetery, most probably the Powązki Cemetery in Warsaw. The decision to set the action in a Christian cemetery appears to break the automatic association that limits the use of words cemetery and Poland exclusively to the context of the Holocaust. On the other hand, it opens a way to formulate the central conclusion of the novel that an Israeli confrontation with Poland may have more than just one version, and that the division between the Polish and the Israeli is not always a clear one. It is in that scene, in the cemetery, that all the Polish and Israeli characters from Haneches meet, and Mika learns from Regina that her Polish lover from before the war is most likely Mika's grandfather. In this way, the motif of Poland as a cemetery slips out of its symbolic field traditionally ascribed to it by Israeli literature. It becomes a space where the boundaries between national perspectives and nationally determined experiences are blurred. This goal is also achieved by the author's decision to involve Mika and Tomasz in a passionate romance, which of course replicates her grandmother's story. Thus represented, Warsaw, which apart from its identity as a cemetery also acquires other meanings, becomes, in accordance with Michael Rothberg's theory, a field where multidirectional memory operates, within whose frames, here I quote from Rothberg, the overlaying and interferences of memory help the process of constituting the public sphere, as well as the various individual and collective subjects searching for a space where they could express themselves. End of the quote. Modan's deconstruction of collective memory schemata 
is not thus limited to criticizing the patterns solidified in the Israeli mainstream narrative, but also allows for questioning the exclusive and, and <clears throat> sorry, and unequivocal character of the general uh, national perspective that is usually imposed. And now I'll move to, to the second example I've prepared for today. The survivor grandson connection uh, as an attempt to demythologize the Holocaust, though in a different way, stands at the center of the novel Hashtikot by Yuval Yagerach. Uh, Hashtikot uh, we can translate as the silence. This book, is both a project of finding uh, out a crucial part of family history, but also an attempt at rewriting the monumental narrative functioning on collective levels and regaining its individual meaning. In one interview, Yerach admitted that the only way to at least partially know about his grandmother's experiences, which could make one think about the, uh, the broader context of the Holocaust, was his attempt to retrace her life from an everyday perspective by describing it day by day and almost obsessively recreating all the details. Therefore, Yager accepts the challenge of producing a total narrative, <clears throat> a historical novel recreating wartime events from his own family's history, in particular those from his grandmother Manya's life, which he documents day by day with special attention paid to the time of the Holocaust. In a very detailed manner, he describes his grandmother's life from the day of her birth in 1914, through her time in the Krakow ghetto, subsequently her stay in the Płaszów concentration camp, and finally Birkenau. The last part of the novel describes the post-war years of the, of the family and the time when they together leave for Palestine. As we know from the note which prefaces the text, the process of writing down the family history was preceded by extensive research in Polish and Israeli archives. However, what draws the reader's attention and makes us think about the author's motivation is this obsessive particularity. Each subpart of the 500 page long text starts with information about the date, the atmospheric temperature, and sometimes even Mania's actual, uh, actual wave. These compulsive attempts at recreating the details of that re uh, reality, which was uh, irretrievably lost with the grandmother's death, the reappearing cruel and detailed descriptions of the reality of the camp, hunger, hunger, cold, and fear are supposed to bring the author and the readers closer to understanding that reality. The history, which was first hidden in Manya's silence, to which the title of the novel refers, and which after her death was apparently lost forever, includes the experience which lies at the heart of the author's and many of his peers' identity. And now I quote uh, Yuval Yerach, the author. That book is based on the life of my grandmother, the late Manja Wolfgang. But almost nothing from what I wrote have I heard from her. Over all those years, she said very little herself and always left questions on the subject unanswered. This is why I searched for myself. In fact, one of the factors that made the author write Hashtikot was his inability to identify himself with the national official narratives among which he grew up. And now another quote from Yerach. Despite the school lessons devoted to the Holocaust, articles, newspapers, and TV programs, Holocaust Memorial Day celebrated every year, stories and testimonies, a lot of things were remaining unclear to me. After grandmother's death, I, it started to nag me even more. Because of that, I was reading even more and more. And finally, I started my own book, which, is, which you see in front of yourselves. And even a few times because of it, I visited Poland. As he admitted in one of the interviews, his work on the book was supposed to help him recreate step by step his grandmother's experiences, whereas Poland, on his own conditions and not those dictated by the institutional discourse, becomes a place which holds an identity he is searching for. And especially interesting and different from the story of the earlier phase, version of a story of searching in Poland for answers to the question about one's identity is Itamar Oglev's Bandit. Bandit from 2015, whose starting point was the authentic, though loosely interpreted by the author, story of Amid Rost. 
The plot of the novel is set in the late 1980s, and the main protagonist is the son of Holocaust surviving Jewish woman who left for Israel in the 1960s, and a Polish man and an underground fi fighter who saved her during the war. The main hero, Tadeusz, arrives in Poland to find his father, with whom he has not been in touch since his moving to Israel. He finds him in a veteran home in Warsaw, where the father is spending his last years of life in the hope of explaining the reasons for which his family's complicated life unfolded the way it did. Finally, though initially reluctantly, he goes with the, his father to an unplanned journey to the place of his birth, in which way Bandit adopts the convention of a quest novel. As they travel, Tadeusz listens to his father's stories about his war experiences, his participation in the resistance, imprisonment, and his time in the Majdanek camp, and an escape from it, and final years of the war spent as an underground fighter, as well as the story of Stefan's hiding the Jewish woman, Eva, who later became his wife and Tadeusz's mother. The gradual discovery of those facts shape anew his perception of the father, so far seen as the main cause of his childhood traumas. The fact that the novel is set in communist Poland in the 1980s inevitably brings associations with earlier Hebrew texts representing the reality of those times, such as Judith Handel's and Michal Govrin's report, reportages, which describe the landscape found after their arrival as dead and empty. The, uh, the very identity of the main protagonist, a son of a Polish man and a Jewish woman carrying a Polish name and speaking Polish, defies the traditionally accepted national divisions and breaks away from the pattern presented by Handel and Gogrin and others of an Israeli newcomer confronting a place charged only with the memory of the Holocaust. On the other hand, for Orlev, the Polish landscape is loaded with another meaning. Wrocław, Warsaw, and Lublin, cities which the protagonists visit, are familiar to him. More than, uh, more than only being sites of the Holocaust memory, they embody painful, though sometimes otherwise nostalgic, memories of his childhood spent in Poland. Thanks to its extensive family subplot and the meticulous anal analysis of the protagonist's psyche, Bandit gives numerous reasons to think that one of the most important goals of the novel was to create new possibilities, which arise from setting the action in the concrete and normal. Polish landscape, rather than those formed by the collective experience of memory. And now I have a quote. Outside, I felt a pleasant chill. A night in the countryside, which I had been dreaming of for years, embraced me with the smell of fields, light breeze, and starry sky. From a distance, you could actually hear sounds of the city, but they were far away. I lit a cigarette. My breath was back. I tried to think about something else. For example, that I am sitting here in the country, uh, courtyard of Halina's house and I am smoking a cigarette and it all seems so normal. In no way could I imagine it earlier, but this time it looks like one of million similar moments. End of the quote. Although Tadeusz is the son of a Holocaust survivor, he never looks at Poland through the lens of his mother's Holocaust experiences. They are a theme always present in the background, but it is the father's story that becomes a key to Orlev's description of the Polish experience. The, the protagonist's perspective is not inscribed in the unequivocal and nationally conditioned division into the Polish and Israeli or the Polish and the Jewish, which Tadeusz nonetheless becomes aware of on more than one occasion. And here, another quote. I didn't know Warsaw. I didn't know anyone there. Yet the Polish language, which had surrounded me since the moment I landed, was like music in the background that was supposed to accompany my, me my entire life. Suddenly, I realized how irritating was the unwavering harshness of Hebrew, its dryness, which like sand on the tongue and in, in the teeth, had been filling up my mouth for over two decades. End of the quote. Orlev's story reverses the most common direction adopted by Israeli perspectives in Poland. The author's decision to set the plot in the 1980s and the fact that the protagonists do not symmetrically uh, fit into the recognized generational arrangement reveals in an interesting way the critical potential of the generation category. The main protagonist, Tadeusz, was born short 
directly after the war, so he should be automatically treated as a representative of the second generation. However, the fact that he emigrated to Israel with his mother and his siblings as a teenager means that his identity had uh, has been influenced uh, has been influenced to a large extent by his life in Poland. In that view, the protagonist becomes a hybrid with different experiences and multiple perspectives, whereas his, and by proxy the reader's, perception of Poland is more diverse and to a smaller degree shaped by the cliches rooted in Israeli imagination. And now a few words to sum up. The authors discussed seem to move in the opposite direction from the Misho Ali Tukuma, from the Holocaust to the rebirth narrative. Having grown in the times when the Holocaust was an element constituting the collective identity, they decided to transfer the confrontations with Poland represented in their texts onto an individual level. Instead of replicating motifs rooted in collective imagination, they decided to look at Poland through the prism of individual family experiences and critical thinking about generally accepted patterns of memory. In so doing, they turned Poland into a space in which ambiguities, alternative versions of the apparently known stories, new perspectives, and relational memory coexist. The Israeli third generation's perception of Poland is strictly related to the ways of thinking about Israel's political situation and its stormy, though short, history. The strategies of using cliches about Poland or intentionally defying them often mirror the author's worldview. When they refer to their biographies, the character of the reference is frequently a form of a statement, ideological, ethical, or aesthetic, made in response to the patterns of narrating the Holocaust in Israel. More than of Poland, they speak of the challenges that Israeli collective imagination is to face itself. Therefore, to the question, what do they talk about when they talk about Poland? The reply should be, first of all, about themselves. Thank you. Oops, thank you very much. Um... Yeah, Gorda, uh, my I, my video doesn't work. I'm probably being <clears throat> ah okay, very good. Um, Jakub, shall I shall I uh, chair the Q and A, or would you like to yeah. do that? Well, uh, uh, as you see fit, um, I'd be delighted to 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 chair um, chair that that uh, follow up uh, Q and A session. Uh, it took us a bit longer than we have expected uh, when 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 planning this program. It's uh, so so. Uh, I think we'll need to limit the, the number of questions to just a few. Um, but let's yes, let us um, start. And and uh, we have a few questions in the chat. Please uh, don't hesitate to add more. Um, um, one, uh, the first question is how far has the victory of the um, former right-wing government of Poland, uh, the, the law and uh, justice uh, party in the elections of 2015? How far has this victory been reflected in Hebrew fiction on Poland? Was there any reflection on those last eight years when Poland was, uh, was uh, run by the right-wing yeah. coalition? Uh, well, uh... I'm afraid I need to say, not that I'm aware of, I, I don't think Israeli literature reacted in any substantial way to this political change, uh, in this political change that occurred in Poland in 2015. Uh, although I think this, um, uh, this uh, political situation in Poland was acknowledged in a broader context of Israeli society, also in the context of Israeli anti-governmental protests that uh, started uh, a year and a half ago. But I don't, I don't think there's any literary reflection of of that situation, because also I think it has to do with a very, uh, very important feature of the representations of Poland in the Israeli literature. And I think it also has a little bit to do with what I was trying to, to, to say in this paper that Israeli writers or Israeli, uh, Israeli artists are much more interested in formulating statements about Israel than about Poland. So in this respect, the actual changes occurring in, in contemporary Poland are less, or are of less, less significance to them 
so yes, yeah, so I think that might be the reason. Uh, that might be the reason why we we actually don't have any literary evidence of of what happened in Poland. And I just can follow up on that question. Um, so, so what, what was what was the response among Israelis to this new trend or this new uh, approach to to Poland, uh, this new literary new new trend in 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 those publications? Was there any response? Was were those publications? Were those novels acknowledged uh, in a wider society? Uh, yes, I think I think uh, these three novels I I, I wrote about in uh, in the chapter uh actually were uh were seen pretty well seen also Hutumo Dan's graphic novel was a huge international success but also in Israel it was a it was a very uh, very successful uh I think I I think um, uh, Yereach's, uh, Yereach's uh, novel Hashtikot, the the silence, was uh, a, an especially uh, interesting interesting case because also many literary critic critics uh, define it as something bringing new standards into Israeli Holocaust representations. Because if we look about the history of the uh, of Holocaust literary representations. This way of writing about the Holocaust, this hyper realistic uh, description of of the camp reality, is not something very common in Israeli fictions. Of course, there's uh, there are a lot of memoirs, a lot of testimonies, but uh, but if if we talk about the fiction, there are very there are very few examples of of such writing. So so I think by by many it was considered a. Uh, Mm, a sign of some new standards coming. Thank you, thank you. Um, and and before we will um, go to questions about Hechtkopf, uh, there is one one follow up. Um, uh, is that is that um, are those themes uh, of Israeli Polish relationships? Um, uh, how do they play out in the realm of Israeli film, feature or documentary? So do we see the similar processes as for the film? Uh, yes, so uh, it's, it's very interesting because uh, the, the narrative I'm writing about is really a narrative cons uh, constructed uh, with using various media. We don't talk about only about literature and and cinema, but it's also popular culture, uh, visual arts, uh, performance arts, theater. So, uh, so yes, it's a it's it's a very uh, it's a very inter interdisciplinary uh, narrative, and uh, and I think there actually there are differences. I mean, uh, I mean, you you could say that in a way the media somehow already. Uh, uh, already decides about what the what the message uh, is going to look like. Like for example, uh, popular popular culture tends to be very critical towards those fixed uh, institutional patterns of of remembering. There's uh, in in the recent three, maybe two decades. Uh, there has been a lot of uh, a lot of satirical, uh, very very dark humor like content, uh, criticizing or deconstructing the institution institutional memory. Uh, also, uh, also performance art uh, tend to be very uh, tend to be very critical of of the institutional narratives. But at the same time, there's uh, in, in in my book that was published in September twenty three. Uh, I also have a whole chapter about uh, about the literary texts written by non-professional authors, by which I mostly mean Israeli high school students mm. who uh, write poems, uh, diaries, uh, short stories, and other forms as a result of their participation in the pilgrimages to Polish memorial sites. Uh, it's a very common phenomenon that schools publish whole volumes of such works after the after the uh, the pilgrimages, so there's a lot of material like that, and in this respect, uh, surprisingly or not, literature turns into into this uh, space of uh, of reconstructing this uh, institutional uh, narrative, because many uh, basically 
almost exclusively those texts are based on this opposition between the land of death and the land of life and basically replicate uh the content of uh, of most of such pilgrimages so so actually so what i'm trying to say is that uh that the, the roles can be can be very uh, can be very uh, diversified, but at the same time, I think there is a certain pattern that specific uh, specific genres seem to fit more into specific types of uh, statements. Thank you, thank you, Professor Wojcik. Um, and and uh, as for as for Heck uh, Tkov, uh, um, Professor Lerner, you've mentioned that he's recognized today, um, both uh, in Israel and in Poland, or increasingly recognized. And looking at those and his history, and also as he at his uh, work or post-war history, I, I cannot um, cannot resist in seeing resemblance between him and and another quite famous uh, uh, author, um, Shanser. Uh, uh, who was uh, who was of um, of Jewish origins? He was baptized, but nevertheless, he was coming in from uh, from a Jewish uh, Jewish uh, family, um, Jan Martin Schanzer, and he also just like um, Hechtkopf uh, after the war was involved in Polish film, uh, and then became uh, one of the. I mean, pre-war already he was recognized as a as an illustrator, but post-war he became one of the most important Polish illustrator of kids books. So in the same way, you mentioned that Hechtkopf's illustrations are. Included in the books that uh, Israeli kids are listening, learning, are reading today, um, it's a very, very similar story with with Shanzer. Um, but the question is: Was Hektop aware of the glaring contradiction between his uh, idealized dark images? Um, thank you very much. I think he was very much aware of the kind of contradictions between the different images that he created, uh, the sort of beautiful, uh, sh shiny, kind of uh, idealized images for children and the dark uh, paintings that uh, we've seen only a few of them. I think he was very much aware of his role as an artist and um, also documenting uh, destruction and uh, not only showing beautiful things. I mean, I had a very interesting conversation with Galia Bao, who's uh, one of the leading curators in Israel, and she curated a big exhibition of his art many years ago at the En Harod Museum. She knew him, and she told me. I mean, I interviewed her for when I uh, wrote the chapter, and she told me she, that she considered him to be a real avant-garde in the sense of. Um, an artist that does not only want to make the world, you know, pretty and uh, but uh, document, uh, uh, you know, urban destruction uh, and document, uh, you know, human kind of, uh, um, you know, uh, catastrophic moments um, as well. And, and also he had this other kind of, you know, educational kind of attitude towards uh, children's uh, uh, books. He, he didn't document only the Warsaw ghetto ruins. He also um, documented some cities in Israel. So in the 60s and early 70s, he created a series of uh, drawings, several dozens drawings of uh, um, neighborhoods of uh, southern Tel Aviv, Neve Tzedek and other neighborhoods. And he prepared actually a note uh, written in the late 60s um, where he uh, stated that he created this exhibition to be shown 40 years later when Tel Aviv is uh, celebrating its 100th anniversary. So he had this kind of vision and he wrote in his note, I know I'm not going to be alive, but I have this, I, I plan, uh, he planned the whole exhibition and indeed the exhibition took place in Tel Aviv at the uh, um, uh, uh, Dizengoff House uh, when Tel Aviv celebrated its 100th anniversary and it was, it was beautiful. It was several years after his death. He also documented Jerusalem after the uh, uh, 67 war because he knew that the streets are going to change and the ruins are going to you know look different in the future. So yeah, I think he had this kind of um, historical understanding of, uh, uh, of also of his own role uh, within uh, kind of the 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 story of you know Jewish life across the twentieth century, and did he ever uh, return to Poland? 
after the I don't think so. I know he traveled to New York. I don't think he returned to Poland, uh, mm, to the best of my knowledge. Yeah. But well, he was um, in touch with other Polish uh, artists mm. and he also was involved. He lived in Batyam and he was involved in the creation of the museum in the art museum in Batyam. And there was, he was very much um, concerned with uh, preserving the memory and the heritage of all those lives that were lost. He had, we found in his archive, lists of, um, of artists who, who he knew from before the war and passed away and there's no, and he very much grieved, uh, you know, the loss of all this rich culture um, and wanted to preserve it, yeah. Thank you, Professor Lerner. And um, with this question, I think we will we will uh, need to um, to to finish uh, our our program. Uh, before before doing that, there is actually one question which is relevant to to the where we start and where I would like to to finish, which is uh, what's the readership of the of the Pauline um, series? Uh, are there data on 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 that, Professor uh, uh, Polonski or, or one of the editors? Um, well, one of the things that we've been trying, we, we, the number of sales is relatively small, but I mean, we are actually hoping to increase that. And it's in the hundreds rather than the thousands. But we have been consistently trying to present Pauline not only as a yearbook, that is, as a, a book, but also as a periodical. And we've succeeded now in doing this. And what this means is that it is now possible for institutions to have a subscription to Paulin, and the number of people uh, who look at the articles in Paulin through this is much higher in the thousands. Uh, Francois can say more about this. You're muted, Francois. Yes, uh, I think you explained this uh, in sufficient detail. So it, it is a uh, the the yearbook will be now accessible through the platform of the publisher as a whole, all, also all previous volumes uh, going back now 36 years, which is quite a lot. These are hundreds of contributions. Uh, many of them uh, have really made history uh, in the sense of becoming really seminal contributions to various aspects of, uh, of uh, Polish Jewish history in Eastern Europe. Um, and um, so the the number of downloads, I mean, nowadays we don't think about sold individual copies, uh, but we think about downloaded uh, articles. The number of downloaded articles has has increased dramatically over the past two years, and we expect this to continue. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you. So, so once again, uh, clearly we 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 do have a product placement in this entire program, but we are not not Very shy good. of that uh, at all, and and we recommend um, this publication as well uh, as other publications um, by the Littmann Library of Jewish Civilization. Um, these are um, terribly terribly important pieces of of work. And before I let everybody go, um, I will just, just first of all want to thank all the um, speakers, um, Professor Bujik, uh, uh, Francois, uh, Scott, uh, Anthony, um, Hannah, uh, Professor Lerner, thank you, thank you very much for uh, being us, Mr. Ambassador Burakowski, thank you so much for joining us from Pretoria. Um, thank, uh, big thanks to my colleagues at the Cape Town Holocaust and Genocide Center who, who have been working on that program. And before, um, before we finish, uh, I'd like to just to make sure, uh, to, to reassure everybody that it's, it's, we will, will not only be looking at Poland, uh, uh, during those this kind of programs. And next week we are, um, inviting you for a, a meeting with, uh, with um, that will be devoted to uh, a new museum that is being built in Lithuania. Um, the program is called Making uh, of the Lost Shtetl from the idea to implementation. The new museum will be built in, will be soon open in the small town of Seduva and the meeting will be with its director, director Sergei Kanovich and chief curator Milda Yakulite. And the meeting will be happening next week, June 4. Uh, please please join us on that um, on that Zoom. Um, well, on behalf of the editors of Poland, I'd also like to thank Jakub yes. Nowakowski at the Cape Town Holocaust Center for organizing this important event. And I would also say that there is one volume of Poland specifically dealing with the history of Jews in Lithuania. 
uh, and indeed there is, uh, I think, an article in it on Lithuanian Jewish immigration to South Africa. So this is a volume which will be relevant to the discussion next week. Love it. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Professor. And maybe Thank we you. can have a separate discussion on that special volume in the future. So once again, good night, goodbye, good afternoon. Uh, please stay safe. Uh, in those um, horrible, horrible times that we are, we're, uh, we're living it, uh, living in. And thank you again for joining us from all those places. Thank you so much. All the best. Thank you. Thank you.